if you look at the schedule, I was supposed to be doing this kind of MPSK analysis, but then uh, after seeing what everybody produced in their presentations yesterday, it would largely be redundant because you've seen multiple implementations uh, kind of walking through how to look at MPSK signals and you know lock onto them. I'll still go over that in the end just because I have it and you kind of see it, me working completely within GNU Radio to do this and some of the visualization tools that I've been that we've been developing. Um, so, but we're not going to go deep into it because it seems like everybody here, if you didn't come with the knowledge, you, uh, you already got it yesterday from, uh, from much better presentations than mine. So instead I realized, well, nobody's, we, we've given you a bit of a state of the union of the GNU Radio as a project. Uh, and then Jonathan taught you, you know, told us about um, the, the next version changes from an, like a structural standpoint. But we haven't really gone over a lot of some of the, the, the new features that have come in since last year. And so I figured I'd take some time uh, just, to, just to introduce you to some of the, the newer things that are, have been worked on and, uh, and a, a couple of things that are currently being worked on uh, a little bit on the side that we'll hopefully see, um, see the light of day or, or, or kind of come into the, the master or probably next branch uh, soon for some varying definition of soon. Um, so we'll get right into So version 3.7, I'm not going to talk about that because you can just go and see yesterday's talk again uh, to learn all about the, the guts of it. And, uh, you know, and, and that was, I, I thought, an important lecture to have, especially have on the record and have the PDFs so that we can refer back to it and understand it. I mean, obviously, all the details weren't going to stick in our heads from just one overview uh, lesson. but. Um, but there was a lot there. So one thing that I wanted to point out, this is actually, you know, like the RTL-SDR, this is something that has come about from the community and was completely independently driven by specifically Martin Braun, who you met yesterday morning from uh, uh, Karlsruhe. Um, and so it's now out there in the, uh, the project space, but not right now, at least part of GNU Radio proper. Um, although I'm, I'm I would like to see if I can convince him to, uh, uh, to let us put it directly in there. Um, this is, uh, so for everybody's information, that's uh, to Martin's, uh, I hope he's okay with me doing this. I didn't ask, but I mean, it's out there, so I, I figure there's no reason why I shouldn't. Uh, but that's where you can actually get the code from uh, on GitHub. What this is, is it's a very easy way to create new out-of-tree components and new blocks for those components. Uh, it works for the 3.6 right now, and we'll, we'll be working for the 3.7, but it really is a very well done implementation to get you up and running very quickly. So it's, 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 even be it's better than the how to write a block, trying to copy, and then, you know, uh, go in there and, you know, said search and replace type stuff to, to get your, your new component. Um, it works directly with the CMake lists files, so that when you add a block or remove a block, it updates those list files automatically for us. Uh, it's really convenient. So I've just put down here the um, types of commands that you can run with it. So if you just type gr module once you've downloaded it, and it's, it's a cleverly done project where there's all sorts of kind of code generation stuff that you don't even have to worry about or know about that turn into one simple py.py file that you can then install into your path. And that's all it is, just this one file that gets installed. So grmodtool.py. And you can say, if you're starting a whole new out of tree component that you want to do, you know, your, you know, your new like mod or grbaz or something like that could have just gone grmodtool new mod and uh, creates this out of tree module. And it populates it with all the directories and the directory structure and the make lists and all those things uh, completely for you. Now, once you're in there, you can just say add uh, and or insert, and that creates a, a new block for us. And likewise, you could just do remove or delete uh, if you weren't happy with that or you, you know, want to replace it or something. So the, the key, I'll just kind of walk through something, some kind of canned example. So we're going to create this new, uh, new module, and we're going to call it foo. So I think if I was good enough, I should, in, in all these things, anything with the asterisk, asterisk, um, that's kind of what you type in. So it'll come up and it'll ask you, what's the name of the new module you want to make? And you say foo, and it's going to create gr foo for you. And it actually tells you that. So new directory gr foo, populates it, and, um, and then now, but it's, it's completely empty. 
The next thing you're going to want to do is, is add a block. And so you can just say grmods will add. Now, there's all sorts of options you can put on the command line if you wanted to, to generate these things automatically. But if you leave them blank, like in this case, grmodtool.py add, it asks you the right questions to get all the information that you require. So um, I said um, the, the code type. All right. If you don't know the code type and you enter an incorrect one or just hit enter, it'll actually tell you the proper code types that you can use. And these are things like... Uh, the sync block, so it's, it's a GR sync block. Uh, you know, you can create decimators or interpolators or hierarchical blocks. In fact, I think he even specifies you can do Python hierarchical blocks and C++ hierarchical blocks. Um, and whether or not it's a source or a sync as well. So that's the, the so in this case, my example making uh, foobar is to use a, uh, a sync block. So this is a block that has for every one input, you're producing one output. It's very common style, you know, or multiplies or adders, those types of, of blocks. Uh, yeah, I guess I didn't, I didn't actually get my asterisk thing as I, I had hoped to. So I, I entered sync, so it, it said the, the type of code is sync. Um, then it says enter name of block or code, so that's your new block name. So in this case, my generic bar block. That's going to do all sorts of bar stuff. Uh, so block code identifier, and then, um, oh yeah, then you can enter the uh, list of arguments. So the constructor for this block, you'll enter in there, and you know, it's just, it looks exactly like the argument string that you would put into your header file, uh, or the, the, the constructor of the object in your header file. So it even includes uh, um, default arguments. And then, do you want to generate Python QA code, and do you want to generate um, C++ QA code? Next. Uh, oh, yeah, yes, there is. That's uh, me forgetting how to use Python uh, or uh, Emacs org mode. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I totally forgot that this... Um, when I generated this originally, you know, it's, it's Beamer, it's LaTeX, the slashes so that you escape the underscore, and then I put this into verbatim mode, and I forgot to take them out. So, yes, the, uh, that's, that's the, uh, the excuse. Um, but all you can see here is just it's adding all this stuff for it. Because I just copy and pasted this into LaTeX and then I, I had to mark it up and then I forgot to mark it up correctly. Um, I'll fix that before we publish these. Um, but as you see here, you know, he adds the, the .hs, the .ccs, the, the, the .qa, uh, .py, the XML, so it automatically generates uh, GRC uh, skeleton files for us and uh, edits the CMake lists uh, file. Um, so as I say right there, and what you can do with this is um, anything where it's now your turn to edit code where, you know, because it's going to only do so much, it creates the basic outline skeleton uh, where you need to do stuff is uh, with these uh, um, angle brackets and plus signs. And then there's usually like a, you know, to do information in there. So you look for those and that's where you put in your, your work function and your constructor, argu uh, not arguments, your constructor operations and uh, your input and output file t type sizes and those types of things. Um, but that's, that's pretty much it for making audit tree components and new blocks now. Uh, and it, it's, it really is a, a nice tool. And when, when I'm helping anybody kind of come up online with GNU Radio nowadays, this is what we go to. We, know, we don't create stuff from scratch anymore. We, I, I use this tool, and I, I believe Jonathan uses it as well. Um, so huge, huge help there. Um, so I highly recommend this. As I said, the only real issue that we see, there, there were some bugs and, and, you know, a few things, and, and I know I've filed some bug reports and they're, they're fixed immediately. I think right now it, it looks pretty good. But it is only uh, defined for the 3.6 style. So all these API changes that we're talking about, um, or style changes in 3.7, uh, are not currently represented there. So we can't really use this as we're doing our 3.7 work yet. And so I'm hoping, and, and I've talked to Martin about this, we're hoping to figure out a, the, the proper solution to, to be able to do that. Because you want to be able to do both right now, especially. Because I know a lot of you guys are going to be still working on, uh, on the 3.6, possibly for a while. And when I say 3.6, I really mean pre-3.7, I should, I should specify. Because um, it hasn't changed for a while. So 3.4, 3.5, if you're working on that level, it, it'll work for you. Um, but the 3.7 style uh, is, is yet to come, and I think it'll probably just be an extra flag that you specify or maybe an extra question in the auto, you know, when it's interrogating you on what you want it to do. Um, so we want, we want support for both. So fantastic tool. 
uh, everybody that, that's ever used it comes back with a positive attitude and says this, this really just makes everybody's life more, uh, much easier. Because that's the, that's the design of one of the brilliant designs of, uh, of, of Eric, I'm sure, uh, originally was to make this as extensible and as possible so that you can link against it. And we saw, we've, we've already seen that from a number of these presentations. We saw GR Extras as this external thing that links against GNU Radio to, uh, to use. And this, this is just going to help us even more with that. Yeah, Sean. It does. You actually, you don't have to touch Swig at all in this case. It, it that that is actually complete. So what? And this um, this is actually something that that Josh had been arguing for years for. And we can do it in the three six style. And we do it everywhere in the three seven style. For almost every single block, the the interface files were just the copies of the header files. And really, all you needed was the public, you know, information from those header files. So instead of doing that, what you can just do is tell Swig interface file to link against the header file. So that GR module automatically puts that link in there for us. In very rare cases, you might want to do something really clever with, uh, with the Swig interface to add some stuff or maybe remove some or, or massage something around. Uh, the only thing I can think of is, is Ben's, uh, Ben and I, when the constellation work. I, we have to do a little bit of extra Swigging stuff to just as they're nicety features that help us in Python. So that's the one, one case I can think of where we actually added stuff to the Swig file that the header file didn't. So this just goes that route and says, well, f forget copying this stuff. Just include the right header file so you never have to touch Swig now pretty much at all. And so when you create your block, it would be very you know, surprising if it didn't work in C, uh, the C++ and Python domain. Um, when I first tried to do that publicly, I, I screwed up the GRC XML stuff. But the second time I did it, it worked fine. So, but that's a, that's a fault of XML and how like, you know, flaky it can be. If you do one thing wrong in XML, the whole thing just seems to, to fall apart. So yeah. All right, we've heard talk of this already. Um, we introduced it kind of uh, publicly last year. Um, but it's worth mentioning again uh, because we think it's really very important uh, is the vector optimized library of kernels, so Volk. This, this is solving a problem for us that is, is not, we just, there was no other real um, solutions out there uh, or any ones that worked. So what Volk is, <clears throat> and we tried a few things and they didn't work. Um, it, well, let's see. Yeah, I should pull this up because um, that's why I put it here. It's not going to, uh, it's not going to let me do it from there. That's, what did I say it was about? 3, 4, ED? Yeah, three, EF. 3, 5, FE. 3, 5, Of course, of course this is happening. Like, why, why wouldn't it? They must have switched something out recently. I don't know. I don't think you typed 3, 5, FE. Okay, well, seemed to work actually. All right, so this is this is some stuff that I keep, you know, kind of a, a track of uh, of where uh, what I when we do stuff in GNU Radio, I like when I like to to talk about it. This, um, if we can, hopefully see it again well enough. These are some results that I got when I was studying the use of of Volk in GNU Radio, and should hopefully. Um, illuminate a few of the, the benefits that we get out of it. Uh, so, yeah. so the we introduced Volk initially in 3.5.2. Um, so Volk had been around for a little while, but it was really in 3.5.2 where we started making use of it. So what this was was uh, I looked at 3.5.1, so this is no, no Volk optimization. 
uh, than 352, and the difference there between the red and the blue is there was some internal scheduler work that added some logic to try to keep things organized so that we could properly use the SIMD, uh, basically vector alignment issues. So there's a, there was a little bit of added overhead, and I wanted to see how that impacted uh, the GNU radio scheduler. So I did 351, no, no, no changes, 352 with uh, scheduler changes, but no Volk, and then scheduler changes plus Volk. And so this is the amount of time it takes to compute a billion items in these, these three different uh, uh, domains. And you can see almost always, and in this case, complex to mag, where we're actually taking a square root, not only, you know, the green, except for this, this case, I think that's the only one, except for in this case over here, and I'll explain why later, uh, we see improvements using Volk. Um, but the other interesting thing in this, in like here, like when we're taking a square root, we're seeing a dramatic improvement using, using Volk to compute these, these things. But we're also seeing a decrease in the amount of time used to compute with the new scheduler uh, additions. So as I said, it's overhead in the scheduler. It's more logic and more operations. So I figured it would, it would add a slight percentage of, of time to compute. And it turned out it actually decreased it. And I thought that was strange, and we looked into it. And as far as we can tell, it's because, because we're forcing all of the buffers to be on, um, on byte alignment boundary, on specific byte alignment boundaries, we have to be feeding the cache lines more efficiently. And that's the only excuse that I can think of, is that the majority of the time, we're kind of prepping the memory system a little bit better than we had been when we were just letting it go all over the place. Except for some reason, this care to flow. I don't know why my heat decided to be uh, ugly for this one. But for most of the cases, it was a complete win. And for using Volk, it was, again, a, you know, almost always a complete win. This complex to float was interesting. And as I mentioned in the slide, uh, I was, we're, we have a paper published uh, um, uh, coming up in January at the Wind Forum uh, technical conference that talks a little bit more in depth about all of these issues. When we actually looked at the assembly generated from GCC, uh, complex to float is a really easy operation for GCC to look at and optimize. So what it did is actually does an eight, eight times unrolling of the loop and SIMDizes itself. So it's already calling the SIMD code. So what you're seeing, the reason why Volk is slightly slower is because of the slight amount of overhead that it takes to, and, and the fact that we're not doing the loop unrolling in Volk. So certain times um, GCC actually does the right, you know, that came out wrong. Certain times GCC does the right thing as far as the SIMD optimization of code, especially for very easy functions like uh, uh, complex to float. Um, but again, considering everything, the overall win, and these are just type conversions. If you can read those down there, they're just the type conversions. Very, very low hanging fruit uh, to, to attack. Um, here's a, another look at it where I actually look at percentages difference. So this is the percent uh, improvement over, uh, over the 351, the non Volk um, scheduler. But we'll, uh, we'll look at this one too. So, the other, the other low, the, the next lowest hanging fruit to, uh, to hit would, was the uh, simple math functions. So, doing, you know, multiply uh, of two complex streams, or more, you know, multiple complex streams, multiply and conjugate of two complex streams, um, floating point streams, adding those types of things. Again, we see a slight increase with just the conjugate one. And again, because taking a conjugate is just flipping a bit, and GCC actually optimizes that really well. Um, on the other hand, doing a, a multiplying conjugate is a huge win using Volk. So these are, these are some visualization of the amount of savings of the efficiency we've gained by adding Volk into our system. And I like the blue ones here, too, because it also shows you that we're just gaining efficiency in general by doing this, uh, by scheduling the, the buffer alignment a little bit, um, slightly smarter than it was. So those are some of the, uh, the results of GNU Radio itself that we've, uh, we've, been, we've witnessed from using Volk. So as I said, paper to come that describes a lot more of this in depth um, for GNU Radio. What I do want to point out uh, and make sure this is clear for people who are using GNU Radio with Volk uh, involved is this step of, uh, of, of profiling your machine. So Volk comes with a profiler that's actually very slickly done as far as being able to automate the inclusion of new kernels into Volk. Um, but little little backup vocabulary here. We call a kernel in Volk, say, multiplying two complex vectors together. That's a kernel. 
that in Volk is an abstraction to the underlying implementation, which is a proto kernel, which is like for SSE uh, hardware or SSE2 or Neon or something. Those are all proto kernels. And in fact, you can do these, you can make a proto kernel specific, not even to a SIMD architecture, but to a particular processor if you really wanted to. Um, so it's not just SIMD abstraction, it's actually, you know, it could actually be a processor abstraction if you, you know, if you really want to get down to that level of detail. So what we have here in, in many cases is a kernel that has uh, multiple proto kernels that are available for your, for your processor. So Intel processors, my, my AVX processor, the Sandy Bridge that I have in this laptop has AVX, which also means that it has MMX, SSE, SSE2, SSE3, SSSE3, SSE4.1, 4.2, and, and all these things, right? What is the best version of a proto kernel to run on my processor for a given math kernel? It's not necessarily obvious. It's not necessarily the AVX kernel. You'd think it would be, but it's not necessarily. You don't actually know. And why is that? Um, we don't know. Uh, in many cases, I mean, if we dug down for each individual one, maybe we could find, find out, but let's just leave the machine to tell us that. Because sometimes it could be that we actually just implemented the kernel inefficiently. Even though we're using SIMD, we may be just, we may be doing more instructions than we needed to in one version of SIMD than another. Um, so, that, you know, so some of it could be on us, some of it could just be architectural issues, that this new version just does something slightly differently underneath and, and we don't know, and we can't fix it. So you want a profile. So there's a uh, binary that gets installed called Volk Profile. This thing runs, it takes a few minutes because it goes through every single kernel that's in Volk and profiles all the, the proto kernels that, are, that your processor is capable of running. So if I'm on my Intel machine here, uh, and we have a neon proto kernel, it's obviously not going to profile it because it's a meaningless proto kernel. But it, it, Volk knows what, uh, what your machine is capable of and then tries to figure out the, the most optimal one. Um, <clears throat> then it creates this uh, Volk config file, and that's what's used at runtime when you're using Volk. It queries that to figure out what is, what's the one, the proto kernel that was optimal for your processor. And it does that check once for, for the, the kernel, so it's not constantly rechecking. Um, I say this will change shortly. This was pointed out to me to be a, a possibly huge mistake to put this directly into the home directory, because many people work on machines where your home directory is shared over multiple systems. And so now you've profiled on one system that you've logged into, you log into another one with the same, with the same environment, and, uh, and now you're on a different processor and your Volk config does, is meaningless. So we, we do have to fix that. But even when we fix that, there will be a Volk config file that's generated uh, and, and used the, the same way. Uh, and then there are these, these new uh, dispatchers. So, you, you, so we're abstracting the, the, the information as much as possible out, away from, uh, from the developer using Volk. And we want to put all, as much responsibility into Volk to do the right thing as possible. Uh, and then so if you don't profile, the default behavior is it looks at your, uh, the list of architectures or proto kernels that you can support, and it will just choose like what it, you know, the, the highest value. So it'll choose AVX or SSE4 on my machine. And we figure that's a pretty good guess. You know, you want to optimize, and that's with no other information, that's probably the best guess to, to, to take. But, um, uh, but as we'll see, it's not always um, the right one. So this is the output of, uh, of running um, Volk Profile on my machine. I just did this uh, this morning. So here's, this is a great one. So this rotator puppet is just kind of a phase rotation, so complex multiply uh, with the, of the phaser. Uh, generic, there's always a generic kernel. There's always a generic proto kernel that's just run in C. So it's, it's, a, it's a C library. So that will pretty much guarantee to run on every single processor. There's always a generic function. So you know, even if you don't have optimi optimization for your, your architecture, you can always run that. But look at the savings that you get in that case from running Volk. From computing the same number of items to, from 5.67 on my AVX machine, I was down to 0.17 seconds. I mean, that's a massive, massive saving in, uh, in computational time. Uh, the Diener Leaf to Real is another one where you get this huge savings. Um, although if you look here, the SSE version was slower than the generic version. But the SSE 4.1 version was uh, tremendously faster. 
So, well, in that case, that makes sense because, you're, but, but why SSC and generic were, were flipped around, you know, kind of who knows. Here's another one where, uh, so this is doing a dot product, so a complex dot product, the basic implementation of a, a time domain convolution. Uh, generic, oh, and you see the A and U, so it's unaligned versus aligned. Uh, I'm not going to touch that too much, but um, best aligned architecture was, uh, was SSE, even though we had an SSE 3 uh, um, kernel in there. For some reason, the SSE 3 proves to be slower when you're computing this complex dot product. Uh, again, you wouldn't think that and you wouldn't know that until this guy told you. So, you know, multiplies um, have varying behaviors as well. Um, well, no, that one's pretty, that one's pretty obvious. Um, all right, uh, that's probably uh, horrible to look at, but this is what the Volk config file looks like. I just copy and pasted some uh, uh, data out of it for my machine here. So you can see that some of them, you know, for various ones, it, it just kind of chooses and saves the right version of kernel for both aligned loads and unaligned loads. So you, you kind of know what you're getting at uh, in here. And you can also edit this if you wanted to and manipulate things by hand. If you're using Volk, you can, and again, this is one of the important concepts uh, and why we're, we're hoping that eventually we can break off Volk from GNU Radio and distribute it as its own library. Now, there are logistical concerns with doing that, but it would, I think it would be really nice if we could uh, and put that out there for everybody to more easily use against your, your code. Um, you could still do it. You could still download GNU Radio and use Volk yourself. The license for libvolk is uncertain right now. And it's, it's definitely going to be a version of the GPL. My personal desire for the license, and I haven't talked this over with anybody who makes the decisions, and this, since it's a free software foundation project, I, you know, there's, there's kind of things that we have to go through, and I have to you know, kind of get there. I don't even know how it works at this point yet because I haven't approached them. My personal goal would be for it to be LGPL'd because it's, it's just, it's too useful to, to have any restrictions and any people's concerns over its use. And we still want to benefit from the concept of the GPL to, to you know, feed back into the community of, of users who use it. Um, but yeah, we, we hope it's LGPL. But if you're using this yourself, you know, you just make sure you link against Volk and you include the, the you know, your include path is set up when you compile a GCC. And, uh, and that's all you do. So instead of calling a for loop, you know, the, this is all just set up stuff. So assume that you have some vectors somewhere that are populated with data. And in my, this case, I just, all right, I'll just throw random data into the, these two vectors. But if you were going to do this multiply normally, you'd write your own for loop and iterate over it. And of course, that's what the generic version of the Volk kernel does. But you don't understand that, oh, and there's a typo there too. I knew about that and I forgot about it. Uh, this, this is all you call. So this is the Volk function that tells you that you're going to multiply these two uh, vectors together and produce a third vector. So you're going to multiply vector A versus vector B, and it's going to produce vector C. What I forgot to do here is I need to put um, the last argument is n, the number of items in that vector. Since these are really just C arrays, they're, they're not like STL vectors. They don't know their own size. So, so this should be C comma A comma B comma capital N in this, this case. But that's all you call, and now it's portable. So if you have Volk installed on, on your machine or you move this to other machines with Volk installed um, and recompile and, and run it, Actually, you don't have to recompile, sorry, because um, the Volk runtime profiler and a runtime engine takes care of this for you. That's, that's abstracted SIMD. So now we're running a SIMDized version of uh, uh, complex multiply that you don't have to do all sorts of pragma or if defs or whatever for various versions of SSE. Um, very, very easy to, uh, to use uh, and to create portable optimized code. Um, so, and then if we're running things in, oh, and, and one thing to notice here, uh, to set this up, I just called malloc. And malloc isn't guaranteeing us an alignment, um, but SIMD, if you're familiar with the guts of SIMD code, um, you normally want your, your code to be on specific boundaries, like 16-byte boundaries or AVX 32-byte boundaries. Um, but Volk doesn't care, actually. Volk, Volk understands underneath which one to call. You, you still want to do that when you can, 
but you don't have to is kind of what I'm sh is why I'm showing this with just using straight up malloc. Uh, and then inside of uh, GNU Radio, we're simplifying things down to essentially replacing a lot of for loops in the work function with a single call to Volk. Or maybe, so it, when we get more complicated with our, our use of Volk in more complex work functions, we may have multiple calls to different Volk functions. Um, but here's one where if we were like our, uh, the gr multiply underscore cc uh, block is, is essentially, oh, simple flow multiplier. Um, yeah, there's something. There's something weird. Anyways, yeah, it's flow. I don't. There's a that shouldn't be a C on the uh, the side there. Um, so all we're doing is we're calling the, the the right Volk kernel, the dispatcher for the, for Volk, and we're passing it the the uh, the input uh, the two input streams and an output stream. And again, what GNU Radio is doing behind the scenes is trying to always give you aligned proper boundary aligned uh, um, buffers. So those input items and output items, streams there of buffers, are usually on the right alignment. Um, and that's for efficiency, because you want to call Volk with aligned things. But if you don't, Volk actually doesn't care anymore. It will just run a slower version of, of the kernel if, if you do. But it's, it's all part of the, the optimization of, of using Volk and the optimization of how GNU Radio handles uh, the buffers. Before I move on to the next one, are there any questions on on this? That's right. That's right. So after when you were, if you were using uh, Gunner Radio three point five dot one or two, what did I say two? Uh, and you had this code structured, and then we you updated to 3.5.3, .3, where we started using Volk, you should have gotten an automatic boost in performance. Um, and we actually know that's true, because one of our guys who does a lot of like hardcore computing came back to us and said, you just dropped my processor uh, consumption from like almost at the, the edge to, like, I think it was like less than 60% or something like that. I mean, it was a really nice, nice result in, that, in, in uh, a few cases. And we, we heard yesterday the, um, uh, the case of using Volk uh, uh, for the, um, was it our GN yeah, was the, the GNSS work, the Galileo satellites, they, they went from being able to do four satellites at a time using Volk. They, they think they can, they know they can get eight, and they thought they could push it up to 12. So, you know, get kind of those types of results. So that was kind of automatic. And what's also nice is because this is such a background thing, this doesn't change any APIs to a block, we can constantly be improving behind the scenes between minor versions of GNU Radio using Volk in, in all sorts of blocks. And every time you, up, you, know, you update, you should be getting a faster performing work function. Yeah. Honestly, since three, the, the question was: Are there a lot of changes since the the, the initial work from three five two to three five three? Uh, there's not a whole lot of work that we did. We really hit that that low hanging fruit of the the simple um, uh, math functions and the type conversion functions. The major piece of work that was changed um, that's in three six is the introdu the introduction of gr filter. So we, we took out all the code in GNU Radio Core filter and put that into GR filter. And if you were familiar with how the original filter blocks worked, if you ever tried to dive into them, Eric had originally established a, uh, an abstraction for SIMD code for a few implementations of highly optimized sim handwritten assembly, in some cases, code for, um, for uh, SIMD operation of the filters. So we, were ha we always had highly optimized filters, but of course that abstraction, um, it, was, it was great that it solved the problem at the time, but compared to Volk, it's, it's, a, it's fairly ugly, and we wanted to get rid of a lot of that underneath. So uh, let me finish up and, uh, and we'll go back to you. Um, so when I moved everything to, G to GR filter, all, every, all of the filter stuff was re-architected to use Volk and was, was benchmarked against the old filters. So, and Nine, you know, um, nine out of ten cases, uh, I match the old one. In one case, I'm, the Volk is actually performing better 
than, than the old filter. The other trick that I did, though, was in the FFT filter, the inner, the multiply, once you've done the FFT conversion and you do the inner multiply for the fast convolution, that is now a Volk call. And that almost doubled the speed of our FFT filters. So, you had a follow-on question? Okay. Um, any more questions on, on Volk? Yeah. Uh, do they generally, there, there was a question on that. Um, do I remember the right answer to that? Uh, I believe they do, generally. And of course there's issues if you're changing the size of data, but the multiply should support in, does that actually, Josh, do you remember off the top of your head when, because we talked about in place before, do you remember what our, I th it should be able to. I don't see. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no, there's nothing inherent in Volk that says no, uh, that you can't do in place. Uh, I just it, as as you're saying, it depends on the algorithm. Um, but of course, you're always doing loads in from from your buffer into the SSE register and then back again. But you're kind of always doing that anyways. But yeah, so you can do in place in place work. Anything else? All right. What time are we on here? Two ten. Okay. So um, there was a question the other day about um, I gave a presentation on our polyphase filter bank work in GNU Radius. So there hasn't been a huge amount of work with it. Um, you know, it's it's been optimized a little bit. It's, it's again been converted over to Volk in a lot of ways, mostly because it uses the filter structures that are now Volkized. So it kind of you know trickles up. Um, but there is this one uh, that I think is a really slick uh, implementation here, and I'm almost certain to have to load my, uh, no, this might just work. Okay. So what this is, is uh, if we go back to the first one, the first figure. So what I did was I generate a uh, BPSK signal in this case. And you can see the PSD, you can see the original signal in time, and there's a constellation. Noiseless, but I just wanted to test to make sure this worked. Then what I did is I took uh, a channelizer, one of our polyphase channelizers, and uh, I slotted it over, uh, you know, made 10 channels, uh, over that original BPSK signal. And so now you see the individual channels that have been split up in uh, the channelizer. And then, so we look at that, so there's channels zero through 10. The, the, another perspective of this, that's the constellation of all of those channels. So obviously there's not anything, any recovery to be done from any one of those individual channels. So we've really just kind of destroyed that entire signal. And then what we do is we take a synthesizing filter and we just put all those things back together. And the important thing here is, um, I don't know if this is conveyed to, uh, to me this is really remarkable, I don't know if it's conveyed properly in what's actually happening here. But what we're, do what we're saying here is that we can slice out any amount of spectrum in multiple channels and then glue them back together with absolutely perfect reconstruction at the, uh, the other side. Um, this is a, a hacky example, uh, but I wanted to show the constellation original, you know, in the middle of the channels and then at the end. But what that should allow you to, to kind of, uh, and this is something that we're working on at, uh, with my research at Penn, um, is how this is, can actually be used for interesting uh, communications uh, protocols, and, and uh, specifically when we're talking about dynamic spectrum access type radios. How do you actually efficiently use um, uh, bandwidth over a wide uh, channel with multiple signals at various frequencies and, and various center frequencies. And so I, play, I was playing with this, and, and it's the ability to, to reconstruct and put them back together that, um, um, that's a really interesting phenomenon. So this is actually an example that I threw up. It's on uh, my, the blog. I have this a post on what this means, and it's actually an example and, and code that you can get in, in GNU Radio. Um, and it's just a... So in channel three and in channel seven, 
at a much reduced rate from the original is really all the information you need to recover clock and carrier because almost all the information is carried in the transitions. Uh, that is an interesting point. It's a very so interesting point. The, save us a fair amount of computation the, we take yeah. advantage. The, the point that he's making is when you're doing a lot of synchronization of, of uh, digital signals, most of the information to synchronize is in the band edges. The excess bandwidth of the signal holds that kind of information, which is what you're seeing in channel three and seven. But now we're actually using this at a much reduced sample rate. So we could possibly re-architect a lot of our, our receiver implementations to use just those side, that side information but now we're running at a, at a much smaller sample rate, and so they should be more efficient. Um, I've never seen how those are. I mean, it should be a, a modification of what we currently do. Um, but, but yeah, theoretically, there's, there should be no reason why we can't use that as a, as a so now we're, we have like you know, a fifth of the, the sample rate because you know, we're using both of the side channels. It's a very cool point. So I think this kind of opens up to, to a whole range of new interesting ways of thinking about signals and, and, and uh, spectrum uh, and channels. Uh, so I throw that out there. Uh, this is my, you know, me being an academic wanting to get that information out there and get the implementation of that out there so that we can start really thinking of some neat, uh, neat tools. So that's probably the, as I said, that's probably the, the most that I've worked on with this and if you're not familiar with polyphase, I don't want to give a lecture on it right now, uh, but I, we talked about it in, in last year's conference, and, um, uh, and there's various information about it around, but it's a, it's a pretty powerful um, uh, concept. So, any questions on that before we move on to the next? Okay. Um, the next is GR log. So what is GR log? Uh, and why do we want to log? It's a, it's a logger for uh, GNU Radio. And because as I say, we're not being very neighborly. Uh, when we just spit out stuff to STD out and STD air, that means that you have to then redirect those to wherever you want them to go and maybe you don't want to redirect all STD air or all STD out. What are you gonna do? You're gonna have to, you know, you can go in and edit the code and comment stuff out, but it's not a friendly way to, to, to be with our users. So what we really want is some way to, to have a proper like real logging concept in, integrated into GNU Radio. And this is, this is nearing completion uh, as far as its use. Because what can you do? Um, this is a pretty typical uh, um, way of using loggers. There's multiple levels defined for your logging capabilities. And when you use the logger, you tell it, I want everything uh, debug and, and above. So if you set the debug as your level, anything that's marked as a trace or a debug is now going to go is not going to be spit out. But if you have any of the other ones, they get hidden from, uh, uh, from the, the screen or wherever you're outputting to. So you can set the amount of information that you want to receive from GNU Radio very easily with, uh, with this kind of logger. That's my next slide here. Um, before I get into that. The other thing, no, yeah, we'll share that first. So what this is, so we built this on top of uh, a project called log for cxx um, and if people are following these debates and, and know about loggers, we could get into a probably multi-day debate because the internet seems to have one running for the past 20 years uh, on whether or not this is the right logger to use or not. But we've tried to abstract it down the bottom. We figure this, is, this seems to be the best one that we have access to right now that solves our problem nicely and efficiently, uh, but it's, it's abstracted underneath, so we're, we're wondering if like, we should be able to kind of move it out if we, if we need to. Um, like if boost log ever comes to fruition, that might be a potential replacement. But right now, so a lot of what we have is based on, uh, and the, the capabilities is based on using log for CXX. Just so, just so you think like some of those decisions that were made were made because of them, not necessarily because of us. But there's a, uh, a, an XML file that describes the logger capabilities. Now that's, you can use that to set the default level. Uh, so you can set it default to trace or debug or all if you want to see every message. But more importantly, you can use that to change where that information goes. So instead of just being spit out to standard error or standard out, you can now spit it out to a file or you can, I think you can actually even do it like, you know, with a remote socket or something like that. I haven't looked into the details, but this allows us to, should it will allow us to, uh, to move this stuff and in, in, um, uh, basically it's going to allow us to, to do proper logging. 
I mean, that, that's what it comes down to. And, and it's, it should help out everybody's life when they're trying to do console-based applications without us spitting stuff out at them constantly. Um, and so here's what it looks like inside. You know, you basically, there's, there's macros defined. And the reason why we define those macros uh, is because there's kind of two, uh, two ways of, of handling the logger. We didn't want to add log for CXX as a required dependency. We, you know, we're trying to minimize the number of required dependencies that we have. Um, so, so we made these as, as thin wrappers around, and it, what CMake does is it looks, do you have log for CXX installed? And by, in any case, you can apt get it, you can yum get it. Like there's, there's, it's a standard part of most distributions these days, uh, log for CXX. But if you don't want it, you don't have it, you can, the, these macros will either become standard error, so that it kind of is the, the default behavior is just to continue to push stuff out to standard error, um, and that's your choice. And we want to architect another flag that you can set to actually just make them no op, so that you can just turn off any output whatsoever. But in your code, you put these things down, and now it's up to the user to decide how, we, how they want to use the logger, and everything just kind of works nicely from there. So I think that's actually a really nice new feature that we're um, that we're putting into it. Yeah. Can you access Python? Yes, you have full Python access to the logger uh, to set it up to tear it down um, to reconfigure it. So if you change that XML while it's running, you have to actually ask it to reconfigure because, of course, it's not going to continue to pull the, the configuration file. Can you but, set a debug method in the Python device script? Uh, yes. Yes, you can set the debug uh, um, level in the Python script. Oh, can you put? Can you output a debug message? Um, not right now, but there's no reason why we can't make that happen. Yeah, it's just, it's just another swig thing, right? Because it's they're, they're standard calls, C calls, underneath. Yeah, I'll put that. I'll make sure that's on the to-do list and, and make sure that's implemented. Thanks. Anything else? Okay. So the last of the, the new features, and then we'll, we'll go into my other um, set of examples, is uh, a new thing called control port. So now the GR log shouldn't be too far in the, the, um, the release. Um, this was actually written by somebody else that he and I have been, been working together, and we're working through you know, legal copyright issues right now. But it, it seems like it's, that's on its way, and we should be good. Control port, though, um, no real timeline on this yet. It's a really incredibly powerful concept. Uh, it's also incredibly complicated. And so we're, we're trying to make sure that, again, it's architected in the, in the right way. And again, it adds dependencies that we don't want to make required dependencies in GNU Radio because a lot of people will not need what this is going to provide for us. And so we're trying, we need to make sure we're architecting this thing in such a way that it doesn't impact people who don't want to worry about um, essentially remote procedure calls to GNU Radio. So we call this thing GNU Radio Control Port or GR uh, Control Port. What we want to be able to do is allow kind of remote debugging, ways to look at a, a running flow graph and kind of tap into it and uh, pull out data, pull out samples, set parameters, all completely remotely. When I say it should simplify the work functions greatly is because instead of trying to have multiple outputs for debug information, you should now be able to set uh, to export debug information through control port. Um, and then so, so we have both remote control and remote visualization depending on the level of service that, that you want, you require. Uh, and then the final one is important because as opposed to just trying to, to dump everything to a file or dump everything to a vector or, or keep monitoring something, there's almost no CPU, and I, I think really there's a little, I think there's like a check, um, almost no CPU uh, overhead if you're not actively querying the, um, the control port information. So what does this look like? What does this allow us to do? We have some new radio application that's running in the wild, and we want to be able to, to, to look at it and access it and update it, control it, et cetera. And you don't want to just SSH into a, uh, a box and control it from there. That's, you know, that's not really that efficient, and, and it kind of limits what you can do. And, and, and all this is going to be done, be able to uh, enable runtime. So you're somewhere, you're a remote user, and you want to log into this, this box, and you want to look at these parameters and variables uh, and, and, and access it from kind of wherever you are. And maybe you have multiple uh, radios that are doing various things out there. 
uh, it's essentially an abstracted middleware. Um, and I'm going to just put that out there uh, for all the good and bad. So we could have done it on top of Corbo. We could have done it on top of something like XML RPC. There's a new thing called, newish thing called ICE, uh, which is the Internet Communication Engine. That's the one we decided to go with as the, uh, it seemed to be the best architected implementation of this, uh, of this kind of middleware concept. Um, it should have been done in such a way that we could actually replace, again, that you know, ICE if we turn out not to like it in the end or something better comes along or people just aren't happy with it for some reason. Um, but we've, this is what we've been using to, uh, to get it to work. Uh, and there's ways, this is, um, in, a, in a way, this is kind of a moving target. Essentially what you do is you tell a block that you want to register a variable to be able to get or set that variable through the control port interface. Um, and then there's like a callback function. Well, these callback functions should be your standard accessor functions. So if you have like multiply const with a K, there's a set K accessor and there's like a get K accessor already there. You use those as your callback functions and so control port knows how to, how to handle that information. Um, oh, that's a convenient. But I'm trying to do this, and that's, that's part of what's holding things up, is I'm trying to architect this in a way that, again, makes the definition of new blocks using control port as simple and straightforward as possible. Right now, there's kind of a bit of, of pro programming overhead to get things to work, but um, that's part of what I'm trying to, uh, uh, to work on. Don't know if I'm going to get there. Uh, what do we have here? So we have probes, and we have, so each block itself can export stuff through control port, and there's also these probes that, uh, um, that, are identif that are defined. And so a probe is essentially a sync that exports its data through control port. So you can look at vectors of data at a time as though it was like running through a, a flow graph. Um, and yeah, so we'll go from there to the example. And I know this example works because it's been running the entire time. So what do I have? I've got a very simple implementation where I'm just taking random bits and I'm uh, modulating them with uh, um, QPSK, throwing them through some basic channel model, and then I'm just doing, I'm not doing any frequency or phase offset. I'm really just going to do uh, uh, add noise to it and then use the clock recovery circuit to get our constellation points back. Oh, and then there's, oh, there's the constant loop here. But importantly, the clock sync is exporting information through control port. Uh, and there's this monitor program here. So I showed you what we, you know, the, the idea is that you can attach remotely to an IP address of a GNU radio system running control port. Um, we're going to do it through a loopback device. You know, we're just going to stay within the, the realm here. So all, this is just, and, and um, all those uh, bits are just going to one of those probes. So that, so there's no other sync, there's no other information. This is the entire GNU radio application sitting, um, it's probably on this, off the screen here, this sync test. He's just running in the background, or his GNU radio thing. But this, uh, this control port monitor here, uh, where do you go, is this uh, program here. So what we could do is we could actually attach this remotely if we wanted to. Um, we're just looking at our own, my own IP address right now. Um, Yeah, if you yeah you could if you were running if you had ICE and you had this installed, you should be able to go to that IP address with that port number and uh, and be able to get the pull the data back yourself. And so what I've done here, this um, this block, I can you can kind of double click on them and you can pull up uh, um, samples that are going through the system uh, and see the constellation. I should be able to also pop open the time waveform as well. So uh, this is actually um, integrated with our QT GUI system so that you can use all of, the, uh, all of its capabilities as well. Um, the other thing we can do is we could look uh, at the, uh, a parameter inside of the clock um, sync block and monitor what data is happening and what that parameter is. Now, it's not real time. You're not getting every single sample of it, but every now and then you know, we're, we're polling it and uh, and getting data back from what's going on inside of that block. Um, and then the final one, the loop bandwidth. So if you, I just right clicked on it and pulled up the properties. And so the properties tell me a lot of information about what this guy is. Uh, and then um, the min, max, and default value if it had one. And if I wanted to, I could actually change this live. And um, let's see what happens to our. Let's 
see if I can do this. Let's go really large. Yeah, there's not a real whole lot happening in this system, so I don't know what's gonna. But, but anyways, it's resetting the uh, the loop bandwidth inside of that block, so you have both the ability to get and set uh, data in uh, in blocks that are are running in this flow graph, um, completely remotely. So, and again, this is just this is one implementation of of the ability to use control port and ICE as the ability to communicate with what's being exported from control port. Um, so, you know, we just have this, these, I mean, oh no, I didn't architect that here. But you could write your own fairly easily uh, as well. So that, that's, a, that's a feature that you can, you can now attach to and, and get data back from or, or control units from. So is there any, uh, are there any questions on that? Are people excited about that kind of functionality? Oh, cool. Very good. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I thought that was that's pretty slick. That that, that concept, great. great. Um, okay, so that does it for uh, for that. Um, before I go on to, to kind of walking through some of the MPSK stuff that I've got prepared, are there any questions on anything else that you want to hear about what what's been going on? Yeah, Max. Ah, GRGPU. So that was um, presented last uh, last year at the conference. Um, Will Plushka from University of Maryland presented it. It's a it's a way it's a it's a an external component from GNU Radio that works with GNU Radio and with the scheduler to allow us to move samples from a host processor to a GPU, do the processing on the GPU, and then move it back to the host. And so we can use the GPU as a coprocessor. Uh, now, where that is, is uh, Will has published it on GitHub. Uh, it hasn't made its way into GNU Radio, and I don't think it's going to make its way into GNU Radio proper, partly because some of the, it, it doesn't depend on CUDA, but it does use CUDA pretty specifically right now, and that's, licensing just doesn't allow us really to use CUDA. But we, again, that's what we, I particularly am, I'm um, appreciative of GNU Radio over this past year is seeing all these projects that are like that, that uh, connect directly to GNU Radio without having to be part of the core source. So GRGPU does exist out there and, and, um, and it is usable uh, against GNU Radio, but it probably won't make its way into GNU Radio proper. There might be, there's what we saw with, uh, with Greasy yesterday or uh, you know, GR Easy, from the Virginia Tech students um, is, a, is a similar concept in some ways of, of using FPGAs as coprocessors. So I think the thing to do and to think about is how we make that, ge like genericize that concept so that coprocessors and the ability to move between um, um, device memory efficiently and inside GNU Radio so that we kind of generalize those architectures. That's where I would like to see things go. Um, it's going to be hard to do it as, you know, in that general of a way, but I, that, that's, that's where you'd like to see things go. Anything else? Yeah. I'm sorry? Uh, the event-based schedule, that, that's still a work in, pro in progress. And that, we do still have hopes that gets put into GNU Radio eventually. Um, Tim, do you want to say anything about that? Just work in progress. <laughs> it's a it's a it's a cool concept, but it, it, it's it's a difficult one, and, and so yeah, ju that's just a work in progress. Um, uh, <laughs> do you want to say anything? Yeah. So when you have something that, that has a, a time boundary, you know, TDMA is an example where you have a packet that comes in and then you want to process that, and the streaming model of GNU Radio starts to break down as, as the ability to handle packets and bursty packets of information. That's where you kind of want to move away from the streaming scheduler and go to this event-based scheduler. So an event happens and you launch an event, and, and then you can process it in there in whatever way, you know, you, you then please. Um, 
you can you saw this morning from from Josh and from John Wellsbury with their their tunnel work or their their tunnel replacement uh, work is some of the, a lot of that stuff can be done using stream tags with you know sample boundaries and, and information. In in a lot of ways though, the event based scheduler should be a more natural representation of events. So an event takes place when a packet comes in or when you want to launch a packet. And so this, this is hopefully a, a much more natural. And in some ways, it should be a bit lighter weight. So instead of always pulling the message queue uh, and the, the stream tags, you're just, you know, the, the event queue is, is managing when things, uh, when things happen. Um, but you can imagine that tying that in with a streaming scheduler of GNU Radio, there's a lot of concerns and a lot of things to, to think about. Um, so we're, we're, we're still working on those issues. Anything else? All right. So I'll just finish off the, uh, the hour here with, um, uh, with some other examples that I have. And these are all available. Um, I kind of do this as a tutorial. It started off as a tutorial for um, new students into GNU Radio and communications in a lot of ways. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so I put together a, a handful of, of scripts that just kind of walk through designing a MPSK receiver. So I'll just walk through those right now. Before we even get to MPSK, though, I, let's see, where, which one should I, I think I'll start with the multipass simulator. So I just wanted to be able to show in some way that, that I thought would um, uh, be recognizable to people who are, who are not RF people, but who um, are communications people, but who uh, have been, you know, alive. Um, <laughs> because at least I hope so. I don't actually. I'd say that I don't even know if that's true anymore. Um, but anybody who's ever touched a, a stereo should have seen an equalizer. And what is an equalizer? And it's basically a, it's a filter that's doing things at various frequencies. And so I architected this to look at multipath as essentially the inverse of the equalizer. Uh, and then so I, I constructed this in a way such that there were. I forget how many taps in my multipath environment here, but I architected to have three of them be controllable with sliders on the side here. So you should be, you know, we can drag this down and you can see the effect of changing one filter tap in this, in this particular simulation and this one. So this is like, you know, these are the kind of, uh, of, of impacts, uh, channel impacts that, um, that we might be, uh, uh, want to be aware of, and, and this is an extreme example, you know, putting these three notches into the spectrum. That's not unheard of, but, but fairly extreme. So I just wanted to have that kind of a representation for people to, to kind of know what an equalizer was. And of course, what you want to do with the equalizer then for multipath is essentially invert this and flatten it out uh, in, 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 in various ways. Don't do it with the zeros, though. Don't do, yeah, don't do it with those zeros. The rest division by zero yeah. So, um, so that, that's one just, you know, simple simulator uh, for learning, you know, for, for starting to learn comms. Here's another one. This is just looking at a standard QPSK signal that's been root raise cosine modulated, uh, um, filtered and upsampled. So I believe this comes in at like four samples per second, just so that you get a kind of a good idea of the shape of things and the time waveform and, uh, and, and the constellation. And, you know, we can pause this guy and, and see the see the root raise cosine and actually turn on there. So you can start to see how the RRC filter is not a Nyquist filter and it's adding inner symbol interference. So this is a no, a no noise or it's a very low noise uh, simulation right now. So all of that, the cloudiness on the other side there is, uh, is inner symbol interference caused by the root raise cosine filter. And of course, that's important to understand because we're using the root race cosine filter on the transmitter to do the bandwidth shaping. We're using the, the root race cosine filter on the receiver to, com to complement it and complete the Nyquist shaping to now get our, uh, to minimize our ISI. Um, so that's, that's kind of stage. Oh no, that, that was actually, that was a noiseless system. Uh, the kind of the next stage is to actually add a channel in here. So this channel now takes that root race cosine signal. It adds some fake multipath uh, that I put into it. Um, you can, we can add noise to the system and see how that affects the, the constellation. And then noise is always is very well understood from almost anybody that's, that's again, thought about communications. Well, 
I shouldn't say it's well understood. It's well known, but not perfectly understood by, by a lot of people. Um, but it's there, and we all, we all know AWGN channels. But there's all these other uh, um, aspects to uh, receiving a signal, and that's if, uh, if we had timing offset. Now, of course, it's really hard to see in this scenario because that's so ugly over there. But now, instead of having these points that were consistently being plotted along this constellation, they're now moving all over the place because what we're doing is simulating uh, clock offsets between the transmitter and receiver. And that, again, that's a physical property of, of clocks that we have to be aware of and we want to be able to, uh, to adjust. Another one that we can add into it is uh, frequency offset. So now you can see that's our, our original QPSK signal through, through this channel simulator with noise, multipath, timing, and frequency offset. And that's what we're, we have to recover on the other side at the receiver. So we stop that and then we move on. This is where I'm adding my, um, uh, my timing recovery loop. So I'm going to ignore coarse frequency offset. We're going to assume that we're close enough that we cited it or, or used it because while the FLL block in GNU Radio works, for most, most people it seems to work. Some situations it, it's not ideal, but it, it, it's not, it does move around a little bit. So it makes visualizing what's happening very difficult. So we're, we're, we're saying that we're already coarsely frequency synchronized. Um, but we could be fine, have a, a fine frequency offset that we have to correct for. So instead of, so, so the first stage then to do is recover our symbol timing. And that's, as we're slipping samples between that, that timing offset between the transmitter and receiver, we need to figure out the optimal sampling point uh, on that, that, that waveform. Now in this case, I'm using a, uh, this polyphase clock sync. It's my favorite implementation of a clock uh, a recovery circuit, uh, but I seem to be the only person in the world that can get it to work. Uh, so, um, and, and it always seems to converge for me and other people have problems. The, the, the trick is really that it comes down to figuring out how to define your filter taps. And so it's a root race cosine filter and it's, it's got this, somewhat non-intuitive until you actually understand how the algorithm works way of implementing the prototype filter. So it is a filter bank, so you define the prototype filter and those, those taps get distributed across this filter bank. Um, so, you, so you have to kind of understand that to understand how you write your taps. But the benefit that you get out of this guy is the ability to, um, that you're not only doing the, the symbol synchronization or the sample synchronization, it's also doing the down conversion step for you. So it's, it's decimating to one output sample per symbol, but it's also doing your matched filtering. It's applying the root race cosine filter to this, the signal it's, itself. So it's kind of giving you three steps in one. Uh, so it's a pretty nice, uh, nice block to, to use. So if we look at the constellation out of the channel model and uh, into the channel model and out of the channel. Um, sorry. If you look at the constellations out of the channel model and out of the, the um, clock recovery loop, this is what we're seeing. And the reason why you're seeing it this way is uh, the multipath. So I haven't turned off multipath in this scenario. Um, and I can even add, you can see, so you see now it's kind of spinning around like not well, you know, kind of moving around, that's timing offset, but you, you know, the, the guy on the side here uh, didn't move. Now we can get him to move if we go really fast. There, you, you saw him kind of move and then converge and recover again. Um, and you know, throwing, throwing a bit of noise into the signal until, until our multipath basically is, uh, is, is just inside of our, the big clouds of. Now of course, frequency sync, it, we don't have a frequency uh, uh, correction or phase correction, so so that's going to throw things off. We haven't we haven't fixed that that part yet. But I can you know I just define these set of taps here. I just uh, disable them and enable them and rerun it. And this uh, takes a bit of time and I 32 sample kill samples per second to converge. But you know so that's a that's a no multipath situation uh, and no noise. So that is a great comm system. Um, So, that, so now we've got the ability to, uh, uh, to lock to our, our timing of our, of our signals and recover it. Um, but what about that multipath? So I've defined some, some multipath taps here for our, our channel simulator. I've still got my clock synchronizer, but I've got this, uh, the, the CMA equalizer uh, output. 
And so we want to be able to, uh, so this is, a, you know, it's constant modulus algorithm, works for PSK pretty nicely. The, the difference here is that now my clock sync, I'm actually producing two samples per symbol out, and that's to look at the, uh, the, the, the aliasing effects of the channel for the equalizer. This does actually work with one, so the CMA will work and converge with one uh, sample per symbol, but it's, it's nicer to feed it to. Um, and it, out of it will come one. So remember our original, you, know, you can kind of still see a lot of the, uh, um, the effects of multipath um, in, in that situation. Uh, I don't know why the timing offset's not. Oh, I probably didn't program it. But you can see how uh, the CMA has basically taken that multipath and inverted it and, and, and subtracted it out of the system. But you can also see that there's a, there's a rotation there in the uh, slight phase rotation um, that just kind of happened to be where this guy converged. Well, the multipath in my case was, it was complex, so it actually does have you know, amplitude and phase. So it is actually distorting the phase of the signal a little bit. And of course, if we have some kind of fine frequency offset, um, now we, we still haven't corrected for this. But we do have a really nice circle of dots to, to be able to, uh, to look back on, uh, to lock onto. And again, we can pump up our, uh, our noise to get a slightly more realistic simulation here. And then the final stage here, um, ah, we'll just do it here for now. Actually, remove the multipath. Um, cause, and, and I added uh, a bit of timing offset uh, and noise initially to the simulation. So what I did here, finally, is basically add the Costas loop. And again, this is you know kind of the digital implementation of the Costas loop. So what it's doing is it's making decisions on those points, finding how far off the, uh, the ideal markers they are and, and pulling it back. And it's a second order control loop, so it can do both phase and frequency tracking, small frequency tracking. And so instead of just kind of launching this with ideal, uh, um, an ideal state where we had frequency lock and timing lock uh, kind of given to us because there was no change in the channel and no noise, like anybody can synchronize to that. And I just wanted to make sure that we could still synchronize in a situation where we started the algorithms unlocked and with, with bad channel conditions. And you saw it, you know, now it's, it's, it's locked there. Um, I think one thing to, if I can, eh, this is, all right, one thing to watch is if I change the, uh, the frequency offset, as I said, the Casas loop will do a fine frequency offset for us. But, and this is, this is a uh, uh, monitoring what the current frequency estimation of the loop is. Uh, you can see it, I, I increase the frequency offset and uh, it you know, moves around. And uh, it, takes, you know, it takes a little while to, to move down and converge, but then it kind of gets, gets stable because it's now found the right frequency. But if I move it too far, I've actually locked the Casas loop that says, basically, don't wander too far away. Come on, where are you? There you are. Don't wander too far away um, because we don't want you just kind of try to lock to anything or wander around if there's no signal present. So basically when my frequency estimation, which should be this value here uh, times 2 pi, unless it's divided by 2 pi. I forget exactly how, which, which way that goes in my head. But if I pull this, I'm um, probably... Yeah, I've actually already lost, uh, I lost lock because I've moved too far outside of the bandwidth of the, uh, of the signal. So there he is, he's locked there. Let me reduce the noise just so it, it, it kind of, the there. But if I move this up, you see it kind of moving, this, this line is moving up. Oh, you can't actually see the, uh, where did he go? There. So if you can see the y-axis, axis, the one is here. So I've told the, the, the loop, basically, if you get to, to one, you're as far as we want you to go. So it's, you're going to lock there. And so I can go up there. But even if I increase the, the channel or the, the frequency offset, he's sticking at one because the, the thing told him to. And of course, now we're moving far faster than, than the, the loop is allowed to keep up. Because we're locking our frequency, we've lost our, our signal. So there are, there are 
limits that we put onto these systems as far as, as, far as how far off they can be. So it looks like I'm actually, oh, 51 minutes. I can talk for 51 minutes more if you want. Um, but instead of pushing my battery power, uh, are there any questions on that? Again, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, is there some uh, web component syncs so we can put live the, the device so the students can access the need some experiments? So if I understand the question, you're asking if there's like a live stream of samples that you could potentially like remotely access for like a, with real signals coming into it. Um, Somebody may know off the top of their head the, the, the details, but I, I think that there's actually a university in the Netherlands that actually does have some kind of some things like that live and online for, for people to access. I don't know if it's really the raw samples, but I think there are, there's a couple of universities that I know of, and I believe, I, is it TU Delft? I'm going to get that wrong, but it, there's, there's something over there where they actually do, unless it's Dent, it might be Alberg. I don't remember. Um, so those are places to look. Other places to look, if you're a university student, you can probably get access to uh, Orbit, which is the WinLab um, system, and they have a ton of USERPs kind of distributed in, in a large room that you, could, you can potentially uh, kind of timeshare with other, with other researchers. Um, it is open to researchers. I don't know the restrictions of getting access to it. Um, I have visited there. I don't, I don't remember like what, what you need to do. But that and um, is it Planet Lab is the other one? There's a couple of kind of test beds out there, and I know Orbit's, uh, Orbit is one, that allow you to, to remotely access these machines, these radio systems to kind of play around with that. Um, like so, you, you you have a hardware device and you want to connect it. So I mean, obviously, you need a source or a sync block like the UHD. So you know, we use the UHD as the interface to talk to the Edis hardware. But if you're using other things that don't have a GNU radio interface, you'd have to write one yourself. And again, go back to this concept of the community providing uh, uh, aid and experience here, and the uh, the RTL SDR. The the um, you know these things it cost me forty six dollars and I think I'm I've paid the most I've ever met of anybody who's bought one of these things. Most people get them for like between twelve and twenty, um, but you can buy these things that are like less than fifty U S dollars. Plug them in and the uh, Osmocon drivers and the RTL SDR system connects into GNU Radio and provides a block that you can pull up in GNU Radio. So there there are a number of supported devices out there of varying uh, expense and, and, and varying quality um, that are supported natively in GNU Radio. But other devices, you might have to do a little bit of legwork to, to get them up and running. Many devices have like audio output, like so you can kind of left and right speaker can look at like I and Q, and so you can just use the audio s devices to do that to get, again, fairly cheap uh, uh, devices to, to play around with this stuff. In my case, of course, all of this was simulation. Um, so I just generated random, you know, random samples, and I modulated them myself, and I put them through a simulated channel uh, environment. Um, and so, I'll, yeah, I'll kind of move into to that discussion too, and uh, and kind of promote Matt's talk from last year at the the conference. So Matt Edis did a uh, like, why doesn't my signal look like the textbook? And he walked through what what Josh showed us this morning on the UHD calibration. Matt gives you kind of the the, the, the fundamental theoretical background of where those things come from, and there are GNU radio hier GRC blocks and hierarchical blocks that you can use to, uh, to simulate things like IQ imbalance and offsets and, and phase noise. And then he walks through how does this affect GMSK and how does it affect 16 QAM and how does it affect OFDM with 16 QAM and you see all the different you know, uh, penalties that you pay for the different modulations under different conditions. What I like about that concept is 
if you're using uh, you know, GNU Radio to study new signals and new waveforms and new modulators and demodulators, you are going to, to want to run, you know, you're, you're going to simulate it, and, um, and you're going to simulate it in AWGN, and you're going to publish a paper on it. And you're going to get guys like me who say, I don't care about your simulation in AWGN, because it doesn't tell you that that's nowhere near the complexity of the signals that you have to properly receive and properly uh, deal with. So by using things like our channel model, where you can add multipath taps, and you can add timing and frequency offset, um, and I am working right now on actually improving the multipath tap generator. So we just randomly defined complex numbers as our tap. So it's as random and who knows what the channel is. Actually, I'd like to do a bit better job of, of actually doing like Rayleigh, you know, Doppler spread um, uh, uh, multipath. So we have some, you know, stochastically based um, situations. So you can kind of go through that. And that's the next step of being able to prove to to the reviewers and to, to, to comms experts that you, know, you kind of know what you're doing, that if you, can, if you can overcome the problems of the receiver as far as frequency timing and, and multipath effects with your new idea or your new, your new system, um, that's another great step along the way to, to actually deploying this thing. And that's pretty well understood. People do that. You know, there are simulation tools out there. MATLAB has great channel models already in there, and so people do do this. The thing that I've, I don't think I've ever seen, and especially not, not open source, is the impairments model that Matt produced last year. And now think about going into uh, uh, developing a, a transmitter and receiver or transceiver system in a waveform, and you want to fully understand this, and you want to understand the limitations and the boundaries, so when you're creating your hardware and you're, you're de designing your LNA and your power amplifier and your filters and, and all these things and the oscillators, what are, you know, what are the properties of your, of your transceiver system do you have to meet uh, to make your waveform work? Well, now you can simulate that to a large extent. And that, that gets you even closer to, to a system that you could conceivably run over the air. So kind of following those steps gets you to a, to a place where you're, you can be pretty confident and comfortable when you actually try to deploy this, that you're, you know, you're, you're that much closer to, to making this work. Because um, without knowing how, how to solve these problems uh, or, or the boundary conditions of your problem, you know, you're, you're going to be struggling for a while. So this simplifies that, that process from idea to, uh, to prototype uh, in, a, in a huge, huge way. Anything else? Yeah, Edmar. So the restrictions are um, probably implementation specific because I was just told that it's not working with 16 or 64 QAM, even though it works with 16, and that that might be a hackfest project for for tomorrow. Ideally, theoretically, the way that this filter works is um, is it actually takes the derivative of the ma the um, the match filter. So if you think about a root race cosine, the derivative has a zero that uh, that goes that it, that goes through zero at the proper sampling point. So that peak is the derivative that becomes a zero. And what you're doing is you're driving this circuit, the control loop. You're driving that point to minimize the error signal, and the error signal is that derivative curve. So that's kind of your S curve. Um, it so it's based on the filter, and, and it should work with any PAM modulation signal. Um, but it's, it looks like there may be some implementation issues uh, about this for. But it, I know it works for PSK, uh, QPSK, APSK, uh, done 32 PSK, uh, simulated, not over the air, uh, and 16 QAM. I think when when I think Matt and I were together when we kind of finally kind of put it together and saw it all working, and we did like 10, 24 QAM in simulation, and it actually worked then. So so we know it scales, um, but it seems like like there needs to be some work on it. So theoretically, though. It's, uh, it should be any PAM uh, signal. Ben. Oh, the AGC. Oh, that 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 would make that can make sense. The AGC. Okay, great. So, <laughs> so there is no problem. It's um, but but like I said, it does seem um, you do have to kind of look at the the uh, implementation details and understand it to be able to set those filter taps, or more likely look at something that I've produced and copy and paste them because I. I've been getting this to work, and all of our digital receivers that are running in GNU Radio right now run this as their, their tracking loop for, for timing. So we know it works, but it, it seems to, um, but I think it's, I think it's a, 
misunderstanding of, of what those prototype taps are, um, prototype filter taps are. Yeah, Max. Yeah, uh, the, yeah, the question is, um, what's the state of equalizers in GNU Radio? Um, and because they do, they, they do te seem to be kind of f um, flaky, not the right word, um, finicky, uh, I guess. Um, the, we have the constant modulus algorithm uh, implemented. We, we saw that in this example here. And we also have a, a LMS decision directed uh, equalizer. And both of those I've gotten to work with signals that I've actually captured over the air. Um, the problem that I ran into is when I was actually going about f coding them, fixing them up to some extent, and getting them to work, is that when I actually looked at my channel, my channel was incredibly clean. And I always make fun of people for saying that they're working in AWGN and that you never see AWGN channels. There's always multipath, except in the case when you're working on equalizers and you need multipath. Then it's nowhere to be found. So, so it worked great in those situations. And I have worked on, on other kind of random signals where I've, I've got it to, um, to uh, converge. Um, but, I, but I've also known people who use it. And it's not a comp, like the CMA algorithm uh, equalizer, I'll go back to this one where we were using it. it. It's not that complicated as far as setting it up. All you do is you define the number of taps, which is how, you know, how accurate you need the, the channel model to be. The modulus, which, you know, if you just kind of make sure your signal's coming in at plus or minus one, you know, that's, that's your modulus there. And then you give it a gain. And again, this gain is, it's a control loop. So it's, it's the same kind of loopback um, uh, uh, gain that you, you want. And then the number of uh, samples per symbol. That's not a whole lot of information that you don't know. The gain is probably the one thing that you really need to adjust. Maybe the number of taps, if you have some kind of feel for the number of taps that you want. Not that complicated, but people do seem to have problems with it with various signals. So I think it's maybe the complexity of the multipath of those signals that it, where, where it finally breaks apart. It's, no, yeah, it's not possible in that way. Um, They're independent data streams. Yeah. So the same data stream, exactly the data stream, Oh. Then, yeah, actually, you're, yes, that does actually sound like a multipath issue, like, a, or a simulated multipath issue. I, so, yeah, it actually does. I thought they were independent streams that you're talking about. No, that's, that's interesting. That's kind of an interesting problem, but it, but yeah, I, I agree. It seems like a multipath issue. So as I said, we have the two defined. Um, we have two and two point one equalizers in GNU Radio right now, and I've used the CMA and I've used the uh, LMS decision directed one. There is I spent like an hour trying to code up the Kurtotic, uh based equalizer, and um, I didn't get it to work at that point. And um, it's Kurtotic, uh K U R T Kurtot O T. I see the kurtosis, the fourth moment of uh, uh, the fourth moment of a of a ver um, statistical variable. It's uh, it's an interesting concept. It's fairly heavyweight to compute because you're computing the fourth moment, um, but it should converge uh, uh, fairly rapidly and um, exactly uh, if I got the math right to get it to work. And I haven't yet, and I haven't gone back to try. So it's in there. It's kind of it's kind of a little Easter egg in there. Um, if anybody wants to go and hack at it and fix it before I get to it, but but it's an interesting one. Is there anything else? All right, we've got another half an hour uh, uh, break, and then uh, we've got uh, Philip Allister and Tom Zoe to talk about embedded systems at three thirty.